After taking multiple blows in the last few months, China's mega cap stocks and especially the internet based ones are beginning to show signs of life. Stocks of Alibaba, Mechuan, JD.com and Baidu have all jumped by over 40% in the second half of March. And what's really helped spruce up the Chinese stock markets were a series of statements and promises made by China's top economic officials assuring investors that the crackdown on internet companies was nearing its end and it was their government's intention to stabilize and support the capital markets. But having said this, a government-engineered reversal cannot remove the many macroeconomic headwinds that remain at play. And so in this video, we shall put together what China offers and what it doesn't offer as we look to answer the question, is now a good time to invest in China? Let's begin. Investing in China is not always easy, but as it stands, there is no other country that can replace it. There are many reasons why foreign companies invest in China, but let's stick with the top three motivations. Firstly, China is the world's second largest economy with a GDP of $18 trillion and a population of almost 1.5 billion, making it a huge market for investors, companies, countries, importers, etc. Secondly, China continues to offer a unique and irreplaceable environment for manufacturing in the form of a large pool of workers, essential raw materials and a high quality of infrastructure. And thirdly, Chinese businesses are now challenging global players based in the United States, Europe and Japan in terms of innovation and experimental business models. In numbers, China spends about 2.5% of its GDP on research and development, which then helps them spawn enterprises in areas like e-commerce, robotics, artificial intelligence, healthcare, etc., thereby carving a promising growth runway for themselves. It's a combination of these three factors and President Xi Jinping's personal ambition of attracting foreign capital that has seen investors flock into China. As a matter of fact, since 2013, overseas holdings of local stocks and bonds have collectively increased by more than 700%, with investments now crossing 8.5 trillion yuan, which comes to about $1.3 trillion. Of course, President Xi's intentions have been self-serving as attracting foreign capital does help China accelerate financial integration with world markets and more importantly, it helps in boosting the international usage of the Chinese currency. Now, all FDI or foreign direct investment is not the same. For instance, the FDI that the United States receives is mostly in the form of mergers and acquisitions, while the FDI that comes into China is mainly from greenfield investments, which involves the building of new factories which serves well for that country. Further, China is seeing a growing proportion of foreign investment going into its services sector, particularly in areas like social security and healthcare. The point is this, in spite of the hurdles that often gets advertised, it is very hard to see any let up in foreign investment in China on account of the many advantages that it presents. The Chinese government and President Xi Jinping's efforts to regain the trust of international investors faces some serious hurdles. Firstly, the sudden and unexpected crackdown on the country's most profitable companies on what can be loosely defined as disorderly capital met with almost everyone's disapproval. This strangulation of Alibaba, Mechuan, Didi Chuxing and others led to a massive confusion and punishing losses for shareholders. And even till today, the regulators are yet to follow through on their recent promises of making policies more transparent and predictable. The second hurdle is the geopolitical situation. On one hand is the ongoing trade friction between the US and China, and on the other hand is China's positively skewed but neutral ties, whatever that means, to Russia. In that context, any decision by the United States to impose sanctions on China or individual Chinese firms for doing business with the Russians is a big concern for foreign investors. A third hurdle facing investors is the re-emergence of the Evergrande crisis. 
You see, real estate is 15 to 20 percent of the Chinese GDP, and it's a country where the cost of owning a house can go up to 70 percent of the household's disposable income. In that context, a property slump can have a profound effect on the economy, including driving it towards a recession and big policy changes towards interest rates. And finally, there is COVID and China's hardline zero COVID strategy with complete lockdown of cities, while effective, can also bring consumption and other parts of the economy to a complete stop, which is another fear with foreign investors. So it's a combination of these four variables that foreign investors are particularly concerned with, and this will need to be factored along with valuations when preparing an investment thesis around China. There is little doubt that Chinese assets are cheap, with the MSCI China index currently trading at its biggest discount to global peers in more than two decades. In numbers, MSCI China's price to book multiple fell to as low as 1.1 times in the month of March, which was its lowest going back to the year 2000. In contrast, the MSCI All Country World Index trades at 2.8 times the price to book, which brings forth a compelling valuation argument in favor of China. In fact, what lends this premise even more weight is that most equity research houses believe that corporate earnings are likely to grow by over 15% over the next 12 months. But if you look at it the other way, cheap valuations are cheap for a reason. And in China's case, it has a lot to do with the downsides that we discussed in the previous section. The political risk, the possible implosion of the property market, or the curtailing of some of the freedom that internet companies had. This last point is very interesting from a valuation standpoint, and I take the example of Alibaba, which revealed in their earnings report that the company will now prioritize user retention over acquisition. This is a significant shift for a company that became China's biggest technology company by pursuing relentless growth. And while it's not clear how much of it had to do with the government's intervention last year, Alibaba's latest quarter has also reported the slowest revenue growth since the company went public in 2014. Now recently, there have been some easing up of regulatory scrutiny, but investors do remain divided on what it could mean for Chinese stocks, but at least mathematically, Chinese stocks do seem to be available on the cheap. The investment analyst community remains divided on the outlook of Chinese stocks. While Credit Suisse and Goldman Sachs have released thick reports on the investability of Chinese stocks, firms like Morgan Stanley and the Bank of America aren't as optimistic as they continue to remain neutral for now. Now, on the positive front, firstly, there is a lot of momentum going the way of Chinese stocks. What I mean is, barring a handful of research houses, a recovery in Chinese stocks is one of 2022's most popular calls being made amongst global investors. And why not? After all, valuations are cheap, there is some easing up on last year's regulatory crackdown, and an easier monetary policy regime is fertile ground to attract more money into the country's financial markets. There is still the question of how much will the markets recover, but China's broader themes of a thriving consumer sector, green energy and becoming the world's largest economy over the next decade are still intact. Overall, the consensus is that Chinese economy will expand by 5.5% in 2022. A second positive I see with China is with what's happening elsewhere, more specifically with the United States. You see, the US is going through a rich bout of inflation and the Federal Reserve is committed to raising interest rates by about five to six times this year. As a result, economic activities in the US are likely to slow down, which opens up a channel for China, which continues to enjoy strong increases in production per capita and unhindered economic growth. This situation is likely to not only aid in the flow of capital from the US into China, but with the Yuan appreciating against the US dollars, it is likely to aid the inflow even further. Beyond the monetary policy and economics, a third reason that gives China an advantage is a lower level of geopolitical risk. You see, the United States is a lot more deeply involved in global issues like the Russia-Ukraine conflict as compared to China, which continues to play the neutral card. 
This is not going unnoticed in the eyes of global investment managers, many of whom now regard China and the Chinese economy as a politically less risky destination than the United States. So these three factors, plus of course the valuation advantage, puts together a convincing investing story towards Chinese stocks, at least from a prudent asset rebalancing perspective. On the negative side, investors will need to assess the impact of an issue like regulatory scrutiny, which often affects individual stocks like Alibaba rather than the entire market. This problem is not organic to the company, but is policy related, which can often be a harder nut to crack. Therefore, investment analysts will need to work on multiple scenarios, which includes the removal or the tightening of these curves. Overall, it seems most analysts believe that the stock markets in China at this current valuation have sufficiently priced in these regulatory issues, along with COVID, thorns in the real estate market, and whatever geopolitical risk there is. Yes, there are policy issues. Yes, there are geopolitical risks. And yes, you have to hold your nose when it comes to volatility. But what's also a yes is that China is among a handful of big economies where there are companies and stocks that are growing at 30, 40, even 50%. And as an investor, one does need to assess how much of a risk is one willing to take and for how much of growth. Now, I don't disagree that investing in Chinese stocks is risky given the multiple hazards that these companies face. But if you get specific, then it's also not that difficult to find some really promising areas that one can sink their teeth into. Let's take China's tech sector as an example, and more specifically, let's talk about Alibaba. Now, Alibaba comes within the world's top 10 companies by market capitalization and has a huge balance sheet. The stock is down by 54% from April of last year, and it won't be incorrect to say that Alibaba is the Amazon.com of China. Now, as an investor, if one is favorable towards investing in an Amazon, then there are not many scenarios which will not justify an investment into Alibaba. I raise this point because as financial markets get a lot bigger, things are likely to get a lot more complex for investors, which will make it all the more important for us to have a disciplined investment methodology, which is devoid of predicting how the market is likely to behave. As ET Money, we have made a wonderful start on this front with our genius intelligent investment service. And if you haven't tried that yet, then do give it a shot. The ET Money app also allows you to invest in China focused mutual funds. Although I should reiterate that there is a temporary blockade on that due to mutual fund companies reaching the $7 billion overseas investing limit that the industry as a whole is allowed. And with this, we come to the end of this video. I sure hope this video has given you some new perspectives. Please do like this video, do subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to catching up with you next week on another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.